right principles. It is wise to know what comes first and what to do first. To begin anything in the middle or at the end is to make a muddle of it. The athlete who began by breaking the tape would not receive the prize. He must begin by facing the starter and towing the mark, and even then a good start is important if he is to win. The pupil does not begin with algebra and literature, but with counting and ABC. So in life, the businessmen who begin at the bottom achieve the more enduring success, and the religious men who reach the highest heights of spiritual knowledge and wisdom are they who have stooped to serve a patient apprenticeship to the humbler tasks and have not scorned the common experiences of humanity or overlooked the lessons to be learned from them. The first things in a sound life, and therefore in a truly happy and successful life, are right principles. Without right principles to begin with, there will be wrong practices to follow with, and a bungled and wretched life to end with. All the infinite variety of calculations which tabulate the commerce and science of the world come out of ten figures. All the hundreds of thousands of books which constitute the literature of the world and perpetuate its thought and genius are built up from the twenty-six letters. The greatest astronomer cannot ignore the ten simple figures. The profoundest man of genius cannot dispense with the twenty-six simple characters. The fundamentals of all things are few and simple, yet without them there is no knowledge and no achievement. The fundamentals, the basic principles, in life or true living are also few and simple, and to learn them thoroughly and study how to apply them to all the details of life is to avoid confusion and to secure a substantial foundation for the orderly building up of an invincible character and a permanent success and to succeed in comprehending those principles in their innumerable ramifications in the labyrinth of conduct is to become a master of life. The first principles in life are principles of conduct. To name them is easy. As mere words they are on all men's lips. But as fixed sources of action, admitting of no compromise, few have learned them. In this short talk I will deal with five only of these principles. These five are amongst the simplest of the root principles of life, but they are also those that come nearest to the everyday life, for they touch the artisan, the businessman, the householder, the citizen at every point. No one of them can be dispensed with but at severe cost, and he who perfects himself in their application will rise superior to many of the troubles and failures of life, and will come into these springs and currents of thought which flow harmoniously toward the regions of enduring success. The first of these principles is duty. A much hackneyed word, I know, but it contains a rare jewel for him who will seek it by assiduous application. The principle of duty means strict adherence to one's own business, and just as strict non-interference in the business of others. The man who is continually instructing others, gratis, how to manage their affairs, is the one who most mismanages his own. Duty also means undivided attention to the matter in hand, intelligent concentration of the mind on the work to be done. It includes all that is meant by thoroughness, exactness, and efficiency. The details of duties differ with individuals, and each man should know his own duty better than he knows his neighbor's, and better than his neighbor knows his. But although the working details differ, the principle is always the same. Who has mastered the demands of duty? Honesty is the next principle. It means not cheating or overcharging another. It involves the absence of all trickery, lying, and deception by word, look, or gesture. It includes sincerity, the saying what you mean, and the meaning what you say. It scorns cringing policy and shining compliment. It builds up good reputations, and good reputations build up good businesses and bright joy accompanies well-earned success. Who has scaled the heights of honesty? Economy is the third principle. The conservation of one's financial resources is merely the vestibule leading towards the more spacious chambers of true economy. It means, as well, the husbanding of one's physical vitality and mental resources. It demands the conservation of energy 
by the avoidance of enervating self-indulgences and sensual habits. It holds for its followers strength, endurance, vigilance, and the capacity to achieve. It bestows great power on him who learns it well. Who has realized the supreme strength of economy? Liberality follows economy. It is not opposed to it. Only the man of economy can afford to be generous. The spendthrift, whether in money, vitality, or mental energy, wasted so much on his own miserable pleasures as to have none left to bestow upon others. The giving of money is the smallest part of liberality. There is the giving of thoughts and deeds and sympathy, the bestowing of goodwill, the being generous towards calumniators and opponents. It is a principle that begets a noble, far-reaching influence. It brings loving friends and staunch comrades, and is the foe of loneliness and despair. Who has measured the breadth of liberality? Self-control is the last of these five principles, yet the most important. Its neglect is the cause of vast misery, innumerable failures, and tens of thousands of financial, physical, and mental wrecks. Show me the businessman who loses his temper with a customer over some trivial matter, and I will show you a man who, by that condition of mind, is doomed to failure. If all men practiced even the initial stages of self-control, anger, with its consuming and destroying fire, would be unknown. The lessons of patience, purity, gentleness, kindness, and steadfastness, which are contained in the principle of self-control, are slowly learned by men, yet until they are truly learned, a man's character and success are uncertain and insecure. Where is the man who has perfected himself in self-control? Where he may be, he is a master indeed. The five principles are five practices, five avenues to achievement, and five sources of knowledge. It is an old saying and a good rule that practice makes perfect, and he who would make his own wisdom, which is inherent in those principles, must not merely have them on his lips, they must be established in his heart. To know them and receive what they alone can bring, he must do them and give them out in his actions.